I'm Liz Tsai from High Operator, and today I'll be talking about the role of humans in the future of automation. So tech talks are important because it's so nice to get the whole community in one place. I and mean, yes, we see each other, we work with each other, but it's nice to take a day and just reflect on what everyone's working on. Thank you very much, Cody. All right, so can you guys hear me? Yes? Okay. So I'm Liz, I'm the CEO of High Operator, and as Cody explained, we're a 43 North startup that recently moved to Buffalo from New York City and originally San Francisco. So we like to think of ourselves as a tech company disguised as a contact center. So we help our clients, mostly consumer companies, solve their customer service tickets. But at the core of everything that we do is a passion for technology and automation. So I'm an MIT trained engineer by background, and I have an incredible technical team of engineers, scientists, and customer service gurus who all work to help high operator build our tech. And I'm really excited today to talk about something that we spend a lot of time thinking about at High Operator, specifically the role that humans play in a world and workplace that's increasingly being automated. Yes. So it feels like automation is definitely top of mind for Americans these days. So in a study last year, 48% of US adults say that automation and new workplace technologies have mostly hurt American workers. And almost half of them think that workers are going to have less job security in the next few decades as a result. And the vast majority of Americans think that most of the work done today by humans will be done by robots or computers in the next decades. Certainly not a very optimistic picture for humans. Right? And what we watch in you know, popular media portrays it as an even less rosy picture. You know, fears of AI killing us grow and grow. You've got Marvel movies like Captain America. You've got Netflix shows like I Am Mother. And we have a ton of media that's depicting all the ways that AI can magically go wrong. And it kind of feels like the root of these fears goes back to people being worried about their jobs, you know, about their ability to survive in an automated economy. And we have a presidential candidate this year that's building their entire platform on automation, destroying the economy right now, and how, what we can do about it. So what exactly do we mean when we talk about automation, right? So very broadly speaking, automation is just software or hardware that's capable of doing things automatically without human intervention. For a lot of businesses, the most important thing here is just repetition. You know, anything that's done dozens of times over and over again is a good candidate for this. Super simple examples of this might be uh, mass email marketing. For more complex tasks, you might deploy robotic process automation, or RPA. The idea here being that if you have a website or an on-prem or proprietary system, you can program a computer to go to specific pages and click specific buttons um, in a particular order. So you might click a login button, wait for it to load, search through a database, anything that you want to do over and over again where humans are really good at just forgetting a step. The issue is these are very brittle. And much of life and what we do every day is unfortunately not this predictable, and that's where machine learning enables or smart automation comes into play. The more data you feed the algorithm, the more it learns in a sense, and the more the results skew in one direction or another. When implemented correctly, this opens the door to the automation of higher end tasks that, are, that go beyond just simple do X and then Y. But when implemented in the wrong places and without supervision, the great thing about algorithms is they're very scalable. They can end up scaling incorrect processes executed at scale. Right, so I don't know if you guys saw, but a lot of people were really blown away by Google's duplex demo a year ago. You know, a system that would call a restaurant and you know, book a reservation for you. Right, it sort of seemed like, wow, AI really arrived. But a year on, duplex is being rolled out in still a fairly limited capacity to book restaurants. And many of these duplex calls are still requiring a human to still be in that loop. And it's not that they're not good at AI. The truth is that pulling off smart automation for higher order tasks is actually incredibly difficult. So we're going to spend a bit of time talking about where it makes sense to use automation, you know, different types of automation, when to use each, as well as how to use it to supercharge humans. Let's take a quick second and just talk about a quick recap of AI and automation. 
So AI, as my colleague um, Adam spoke about, is the general idea of making systems intelligent. Now this starts from sort of weak or narrow AI, where you're focused on one very specific task, to you know, strong AI where, human, where machines are as smart as humans, to you know, super intelligence, which is mostly associated with robots taking over the world. Most systems that you see that claim to use AI these days are probably operating sort of in the narrow AI scope, where they're focused on one very specific problem. So you might consider your Siri on your iPhone or a customer service chatbot to be part of this category. Whenever you step outside of exactly what they're supposed to do, they become very annoying very, very quickly because they're very brittle and there's one specific application. Um, when you think about machine learning, you know, it's a method of data analysis that tries to give a system the capability to, in a sense, learn without being explicitly programmed. And then you have natural language processing, which is specifically focused on how do you get systems to understand, interpret, and in some sense manipulate human language. Machine learning algorithms do you know, sort of learn in the extent that the more data you give them, the more data they have from which you draw inferences. But it's important to remember that these are statistical tools, right? And the output that you get depends not only on the you know, algorithm that you sort of funnel it all through, but also heavily on the data that you're actually putting into it. You know, my chief scientist at high operator likes to say, garbage in, garbage out. You can transform what you put into it, but you're not going to fundamentally change it in a sense. Um, and real world data is often super messy, noisy, poorly labeled, and it's really hard to make sense of that. So in a sense, machine learning is the science of getting computers to act without being explicitly programmed, but this is very, very different from getting computers to act the way that you want them to and act in desirable, correct ways. Right? I mean, this XKCD comic might be a little tongue-in-cheek here, but it's actually pretty accurate. You get what you put into it. And natural language processing, which we think about a lot in the world of customer service, because so much of it's text-based, is trying to help systems and algorithms make sense of language. And sometimes language is super straightforward, but in the wild, language we encounter in the real world is often very messy. Right? So one thing we do at High Operator is try and make sense of incoming customer service requests. Sometimes we see emails that are nicely typed out, but other times they're being typed on little tiny phone keyboards or short text messages. Right? You, can try and take link, you can try and tackle this problem with machine learning, where you feed your algorithm lots of examples of messy language samples paired with what it means. So in a world where you have a significant amount of data, you know, assuming that you can access the data, clean the data, and make a machine digestible, which is a whole other problem, you have a lot of data that you can apply machine learning tools to. The question we ask ourselves when we use it on a day-to-day -day basis is always, is this the right tool for this job? Right? Why try and fit AI or automation into your problem when a human is better or faster? You know, especially when the cost of failure can be relatively high. One thing that I like to remember is perfectly illustrated here, again by XKCD. Um, so when you do a task by hand, you can technically say that you trained a neural net to do it. Humans are the original neural net, and we have a lot of years of training on how to do the things that make us human. And so we said earlier that machine learning is inherently probabilistic. Right? And the annoying thing about probabilistic systems is that a certain degree of error is always attached to prediction of the behavior of the system. So you can certainly try and optimize your system as much as possible, but there are no guarantees and it can be particularly erratic when it comes to situations with potentially incomplete inputs. For example, something like optical character recognition on the left up there, if a person has fairly good handwriting, might be a good application, especially if you just reject matches that fall below a certain confidence interval. In a situation like customer service with fairly unbounded inputs, where a customer can send you whatever they'd like to send you in more erratic, open-ended statements, it becomes much more difficult. Similarly, you encounter examples where there's just a high, uh, when there's very high confidence interval, like on the left, as well as examples where things get a lot more fuzzy, where you need to think about how you handle graceful failures. So I think there's six dog photos on the right, but I'm actually not 100% sure. So when you get to these fuzzy cases, you have two options. Option one is just to magically make AI better, or ideally get you super intelligence. And option two, the far more accessible option for most of us, is to find ways to seamlessly put humans back in the loop. And to be clear, we're not saying that humans belong in the loop all the time. There are some problems and applications that we, can, we think of as convex. 
So in general, the more you use any machine learning algorithm or system, the better it gets in some direction or another. For convex applications in particular, however, the more you use it, the more likely it is that you have a very positive experience. These sorts of problems are typically ones where it's okay to be wrong. What determines success is the number of times you are right. It's about the true positive rate, in a sense. So one example might be you know, machine learning applied to recruiting, where it scrapes and finds candidates that you wouldn't have been able to otherwise manually find. Or perhaps you have a predictive sales tool that tries to surface the leads that are more likely to close right now. The alternative here is a very manual solution. And so the algorithm doesn't need to be 100% right. It just needs to be a little bit less wrong. Right? In both of these cases, a human is eventually going to work those leads and do the final sorting. All we're asking is for the machine to give us a slight edge, not to be 100% right. But there are a whole other world, world of problems out there um, that we call concave. Right? These are applications where it's really important to be 100% right 100% of the time. So it's all about minimizing the false positive rate. In these applications, you get punished in a really outsized way for getting a wrong relative to the award that you receive for getting a right. So scheduling is a good example of this, as are perhaps medical diagnostics or customer service. So because machine learning is inherently probabilistic, the more you use it, the more likely your algorithm is going to be eventually wrong at some point. Right? Even if you have 98% chance of winning, if you keep going and going and going, at some point you will lose. Right? Um, and when that happens with these applications, someone's going to miss an important meeting, somebody gets misdiagnosed, or a customer figures out that they're talking to a robot, and they get very upset. The anger that this failure inspires is far greater than the slight benefit of using that product. And this is where it's often a good idea to bring the human back into the picture. So when you bring humans back into the picture, there are two things that they can do. You, know, you can have humans in the loop in the sense that they are trying to supervise a machine system. They're either making corrections or they're feeding human-labeled data back into an algorithm to try and make it better. There's some, there are some applications that stop here, where the humans are around simply to provide training data to machine learning and artificial intelligence companies. But where I think it becomes really powerful is when you can immediately turn around and feed that back in and use the improved systems to actually make the same humans better and faster. And at High Operator, we try and do a bit of both. So at our core, we start with really great people, which is part of what brought us out to Buffalo, and we build technology to make them better, faster, and more <coughs> accurate. We don't, think about, uh, we don't think automation here needs to be a dirty word that lets us worry about the future. There's a powerful story to be told here about automation augmenting humans. And this is what we try and do at High Operator. So our goal is to automate customer service. You know, it's an industry that employs 2 to 3% of the US population. However, and this is important, we're not trying to replace humans with chatbots. Rather, we augment customer service agents by automating the bits of the job that humans really aren't that great at. Things that are really repetitive that require a lot of attention to detail. If we want to make people a lot more productive, which will help reduce costs and drive opportunities in this economy for taking risks on new projects. We find that humans are really good at solving fuzzy problems, right? And they're being empathetic, but they're really bad at things like attention to detail. Computers, on the other hand, are really great at deterministic tasks. People are good at interacting with other people. We've spent our entire lives trying to figure it out to you know, some degree or another, how to understand a smile or a tone of voice. We understand what it means to lose a loved one or have a keepsake break, right? But that's one of my favorite lessons of working in customer service. You run quickly into the limits of what machines can do, but you also see their incredible power in helping people focus in on their strengths. And you can unlock a lot of magic by using machines at the tasks that they are good at in step with humans doing the things that they're good at. Think of it as an assembly line with sort of humans and robots working different stations. And the more that you can make humans and robots sort of work together in tandem, rather than choosing between a dichotomy of humans and machines, the better you're able to overcome the inherent weaknesses in both and accent the strengths of each. Thank you guys very much.